Um, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Andriy Partnov. Uh, I'm teaching Ukrainian and East European history and culture at the European University of Viadrina, Frankfurt Order. And I am one of the, uh, let's see, one of the persons really involved in the um, establishment of this project, our project, the European Times project, supported by the Federal Ministry for Education and Research of Germany. And it is my great pleasure that today we start our very first, but not the last, um, conference, which is devoted to the primary topic of our first research year, which is, okay, how could we say it in English? Uh, the history of sciences and humanities. So in German, it's just Wissenschaftsgeschichte, just one word. <laughs> it's much, much shorter. And it is my great pleasure, of course, uh, that uh, today we start uh, with a uh, lecture, keynote a talk, if you wish, by my colleague, Annette Werberger. And uh, before proceeding to that, I just want to say maybe three short and rather technical things. First and foremost, dear colleagues, our conference is translated yeah, and recorded for the YouTube channel. I can say to document our discussions and exchange. Uh, I hope uh, you are, especially our participants, like you agree on that because I've been asked once again to ask you, even though we've asked you already, of course. <laughs> and secondly, I want to use this opportunity to express my deepest gratitude to people who work uh, together with me at the Chair of Integral History of Ukraine because uh, we were again like, responsible uh, for this event. And I mean, uh, Bojana Kozakevich, Maria Kirsanova, Ellen Budinova, they helped me a lot uh, to make uh, this event uh, possible. So thank you very, very much. And last but not least, it is my greatest pleasure uh, to give a floor to our uh, today's moderator. And that's Alexander Verl. Alexander is a professor of culture and literature of Central and Eastern Europe at the University of Potsdam. Earlier, he was a president of the Viadrina University. And he's also, among other functions, he's also the head of the German Association of Ukrainian Studies. So, dear Alexander, now the floor is yours. We are very much looking forward to our today's discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Andre, for this introduction. And uh, thank you for organizing this first conference. This is the first conference of this first third is uh, has a focus on history. Next year, the focus will be literary studies. And the third year, the focus will be cultural studies. And this is now the first conference and the first talk uh, of our colleague, uh, Annette Wierberger. Uh, she's just now the dean of the uh, cultural studies faculty at Viadrina. I think I, I think everybody knows her, but like always, I would like to introduce her um, for this first talk. Uh, she did her master degree in 1996 at the Eberhard Karls University of Tübingen. Uh, she studied Ostslavonic philology, uh, German literature and Eastern European uh, history. And in 2003, she uh, finished her PhD at the University of Tübingen. Uh, and uh, the topic was post symbolistic writing studies to the poetics of Acmeism and Ossip Mandel Stam, what was published in 2005. And in 2011, she finished the habilitation uh, at the University of uh, Tübingen with the Venia Legendi for Slavonic uh, philology and for uh, comparative literature. And uh, this, uh, the habilitation book is also published, D-Books and Demons, Ghosts of Modernism, Culturalization Processes in Jewish Literature of Eastern and Middle Eastern Europe from 1890 to 1939. So um, her, her, her scientific um, career started there in Tübingen where she was uh, um, assistant from 1998 to 2003. Then she was postdoc at the graduate college, the figure of the third at the University of Constance from 2003 to 2004. Uh, then she was uh, assistant again at the uh, Seminar of Slavonic Studies at Tübingen University. And since 2012, she is now a professor for uh, literary science and East European literatures at the European University Viadrina. 
And uh, her focus of uh, research is literatures and cultures of Russia and Eastern and Middle Europe, Middle Eastern and Eastern Europe, uh, entanglement of uh, literature in European context, yiddistic and world literature. And we can congratulate her now to a new project that's the Sonderforschungsbereich at the Free University, where she is Teilprojektleiterin, no idea what that is in English. Uh, this is the topic is intervenierende Künste, even that is difficult to say in uh, English. So intervening arts, I would say. She's also part of um, uh, other projects, uh, entanglement, uh, history of entangled literature in a Jewish context and world literature in the long durée, that is an excellent cluster of University Constance and um, Tübingen together. There will be a publication about world literature in long durée and an anthology of texts to this. She was also a member of the uh, excellence cluster um, Border um, stories in transnational uh, rooms, also a corporate project of Constance University and Tübingen University. And right, there are so many uh, talks and publications that I think it would be too much to name. You can look it up at the homepage. And uh, we are very happy to have this uh, first introductory talk on uh, the general topic of our project European Times. The title is Asynchronicities in Cultural and Literary Studies. So we are very happy to listen to you, Annette, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexander, for your warm words. And um, the, the greatest hindrance at the moment for um, preparing a conference is the pandemic situation and being a dean, but I prepared a, um, a PPP presentation and I tried to um, give it to you. I think it will help a little bit to follow my um, talk. So, yeah. So good afternoon once again, and um, I will give you first a, a rough outline of my um, presentation today. I will start because not everyone is in the U-Time project um, defining a little bit as synchronicities, and I will use also other words for this untranslatable word Ungleichzeitigkeiten. And I will start with this uh, with and against Ernst Bloch's definition of the Ungleichzeitigkeiten. Then I will have a short follow up of the use of asynchronicities for a history of knowledge. And I'm only starting. A lot of colleagues will in the following days uh, tell us about it. Um, does it work or not? And then I will give one example. I'm more knowledgeable uh, than in, in other areas um, um, about the literary and cultural, uh, cultural studies in the 20th century. So uh, let us um, begin and I will look up the chat and Alexander, you, you say something to me if maybe the voice doesn't work or something, please. Because uh, it's always difficult to, um, to view the chat in these situations with a presentation and a text. So defining asynchronicities, Ungleichzeitigkeiten with and against, against Bloch. The conceptual genesis, the beginnings or evolution of asynchronicity, non-simultaneity or non-synchronism can be traced back to the late period of the early German cultural studies. It's not the same than the British cultural studies, but we stress it all the time, but it's, it's the German cultural studies with names like Simmel, Weber, and, and also Ernst Bloch in the 1920s and 1930s. However, its origins as a cultural phenomenon lie in the period after 1789, after the French Revolution, which can be considered a kind of incubation period of a non-synchronicity and the beginning of all attempts to positively connote synchronicity 
or simultaneity in different societies and cultures and to propagate them under the sign of the idea of progress and a universal time regime. In the word combination, simultaneity of the non-simultaneous, or you could also say synchronicity of the asynchronous, um, also Gleichzeitigkeit des Ungleichzeitigen, that, that's the, in, um, the, the famous word of um, Ernst Bloch. The term achieved notoriety in Ernst Bloch's book, Heritage of Our Times. That's the English um, translation in German, it's Erbschaft. Dieser Zeit, from 1935, uh, published in Zurich, as you say, all, already in exile. Um, I give you the may, uh, maybe the most famous uh, quote um, from, from the book. Not all people exist in the same now. They do so only externally, in the sense that they can all be seen today. But that does not mean that they live at the same time with the others. Rather, they carry earlier things with them, things which interfere and are involved. One has one's times according to where one stands corporally, above all in terms of classes. He was a Marxist, you see it <laughs> at, uh, in, in, in this um, uh, term of classes. Times older than the present continue to affect older strata. Here it is easy to return or dream one's way back to older times. In general, different years resound in the one that has just been recorded and prevails. Moreover, they do not emerge in a hidden way as previously, but rather they contradict the now in a very peculiar way. Ori from the, uh, the where, Schief von rückwärts um, her. Bloch uses asynchronicity on the one hand in the sense of an unfinished or insufficient modernization, as he was a Marxist then, thereby describing Nazi ideology and terror that mobilized pre-modern inventory and longings, and thus frighteningly successfully occupies, I quote here another scholar, Hermann Bosinger, who died last week, um, very sorry about it, uh, occupies dream territories of the imagination, according to Hermann Bausinger. Bloch speaks about the asynchronicities of people, classes, and groups. Today, I would like to talk about the asynchronicities of concepts and scientific cultures. A word maybe to the term. As a German language term, Ungleichzeitigkeit was translated into English as non-synchronism, also non-simultaneity, non-synchronicity, or even non-contemporaneity, and I will use it um, further on, non-coevalness, uh, depending on the context. It was not until 1983, and I will give you the names at least, that the anthropologist Johannes Fabian momentously updated and expanded Bloch's simultaneity of the non-simultaneous in his book, Time and the Other, as part of the politics of time of modernity in relation to the allochronous or non-contemporary rest of the Western world, mostly regarded as the so-called third world. This imperative for coevalness, as he calls it, against the denial of coevalness is partly inspired by post-structuralism and post-colonialism. The historian and uh, theorist, um, yeah, he does also do um, theory of history, Berber Bevernage regards 10 years ago the valorization of asynchronicities in the book Breaking Up Time to be the more important concern. Thus, he understands Fabian and Bloch the other way round, I, I, I can say. Although Fabian's critics consider the goal of a simultaneity of all people and communities in the world to be justified, uh, Bevernage emphatically calls for non coevalness as the starting point for an analysis of contemporary political time regimes. Bevernage judges the revelation of non simultaneities or asynchronicities as the more appropriate and just political demand of a globalized world. <laughs> 
The term asynchronicity is elastic and underdetermined enough to be used in relation to many different situations. And it, it, it is in fact used in the feuilletons in many, many different situations. But asynchronicity is mostly used as a placeholder term for events, instruments or actors that were previously designated as a hike, outdated, and pre-modern in the present, which itself is understood as exceptionally modern. So modern people are speaking about the asynchronicity of less modern people, you could say. The, these interpretations are all based on the premise that according to the Enlightenment logic of simultaneity as the paradigm of modernity, such problems should actually disappear instead of suddenly reappearing everywhere. So we will also be concerned with asking in the project in our team whether non-simultaneous phenomena can be analyzed without once again falling into evolutionary thinking or historical fatalism with recurrence to metaphors. This is where our research on asynchronicities should begin in order to understand temporal and spatial pluralism more as a norm than as a deviation. Asynchronicities do not impede development, but, but can perhaps be seen as an important foundation of development processes, of development per se in our times. Complex temporalities and asynchronicities have thus existed since modernity, since the French Revolution, maybe we could say. Therefore, it is not surprising that we find them when we look for them, but there are times in which they are more or less found. Revolutionary times, for example, or maybe also long periods of slow development or even cultural shutdown and standstill, like in the Cold War period. I will show it, I hope, hopefully. Um, yeah, maybe I come to the, to the second chapter, the use of asynchronous, um, asynchronies for the history of knowledge, our, our issue today and our issue in, in this conference. In our first year, Alexander said it already in your time, um, Tim, the study of asynchronicities will help to identify asynchronies in the history that affect communications or the communication between different scientific cultures and communities in East and West. In order to better understand certain cultural turns or form of production of knowledge, we will also focus on small cultures and conflicting understandings of internationalization and cosmopolitanism over the next two years. Everywhere or every time we are interested in the persistence of certain categories or conceptualizations, in, in institutional path dependencies, Fahrtabhängigkeiten, like the social scientists say, and gaps in the consideration and analysis of historical phenomena with regard to the still persisting East-West divide in certain areas of our societies. Question from my field are, for example, why was there less interest in the concept of word literature in Poland, Ukraine or Russia for so long, while in the US, France or Germany, one institute after another has sprung up in recent years and numerous books have been published. I published one myself. Why was postmodernism received with the greatest enthusiasm by Russian speaking scholars in the 1990s? Why was cultural studies such an important project in the West, in Britain and in Germany and Austria, Austria above all? What traces did Marxism-Leninism leave behind in Slavic cultural studies, in Kulturologia, we could say? So my gaze here attempts to look from West to East and to East to West, and I'm maybe not knowledgeable every time, but I am aware that West and East are often theoretical constructs, which I use only to sharpen the differences. And maybe we can ultimately help to recognize them. And perhaps if we find this important to overcome them both ways, where they have a negative or hindering effect in our uh, scholarly program. So let me start with the example the example of literary and cultural studies in the 20th century. 
I divide the 20th century relatively roughly into four parts and then look at these periods according to the following ca characteristics. So I, I looked it up. I think with these four ca characteristics, I can show you a lot of things. Hopefully you, you agree with me in the end. The degree of disciplinarity um, or the degree um, or, or the graduation of a scientification, I know it's not a real English word probably, for Wissenschaftlichung would be the, uh, the German word, or academization of individual disciplines. Mostly I will focus on literary studies. Um, autonomy or hetero uh, heteronomy aesthetics as a, a second topic. Then the reference to the avant-garde, to the avant-gardes in, in plural, and then the east-west convergence or divergence um, will be always uh, focused. My explanation inevitably remains somewhat theoretical, but I try to give examples. The main example is, of course, uh, Roman Jakobson for obvious reasons. Um, the name Roman Jakobson will be mentioned several times. So Jakobson liked to refer to himself simply as a, a Ruski philolog and maybe even a Rassiski philolog, um, Russian philologist, and was in fact an intercontinental linguist, folklorist, and literary scholar who thought in Moscow, Prague, Brno, New York, and Harvard, as everybody of you uh, probably know. Today, we need at least three specialist titles to outline his activities and fields of knowledge. He published in several languages, I can't count them, several Slavic languages, and left his mark equally on French structuralism. There is now published uh, the, the letters between him and Lévi-Strauss. I think they published it four years ago in French, I think. Media studies or American new criticism. His essay, Linguistics and Poetics from 1960, is still one of the basic texts of introductory seminars in literary studies worldwide. In it, he famously defines the poetic function of language as, I quote, the set, the attitude towards the message, as such, focus on the message for its own sake. Language thus functions as literature when it takes care of itself, when poetry and the poetic in text does what poetry in particular can do. Jacobson did not want to reduce the poetic function to poetry and the, the poetry to the poetic function, yet Jacobson's idea of the poetic function then established a kind of tautological idea of literature in the 1950s and 60s that becomes increasingly significant and powerful and the 20th century. So first of all, uh, after introducing once again Jakobson or um, Owls to Athens probably in this context with you all, um, I have four periods. Mm, I have the period a little bit before the French Revolution, um, uh, the, the, the Russian Revolution end of the, uh, the First World War until 1917-18. Then the next, uh, the, the interwar period between the wars, then uh, the period after 1945 and a, a short outlook after 80, 1989, 1991. So let's begin with the, the situation of literary studies East-West um, until 1917 and 18. And you can imagine it's only a, a kind of uh, um, overview uh, uh, to synthesize um, some some ideas. Um, I think they they give a, a good image um, of literary studies in this um, period. The period before 1917 or 19, uh, you can choose the end of the revolution um, at the end of the world war um, in Russia or also in, in, in the Western countries or the beginning of the uh, revolution. And uh, the period before can be summarized as the end of maybe Hobsbawm's long 19th century, but also as the period before World War I and the Russian Revolution. The historical events mark the end of the nationalization processes of modern Western states in the 19th century. In the East, it's only beginning after the revolution. 
Um, and um, it shaped the idea of national literature, and that's important in our context. But, is, um, but it is also the period of imperial ambitions and tendencies of intensive colonization, which influenced motives and thinking of primitivism, of modernism, as well as the formation of institutions and the emergence of many subjects such as sociology, ethnology, linguistics. From today's perspective, this period is characterized by a certain syncretism we would probably say. One did not yet need things in terms like interdisciplinarity or artistic research or cultural turns. One did not always have to turn to something new because one was still agile, you can say uh, critically, because the disciplines were not yet so strongly differentiated. The actors of the arts were not yet so strictly separated from the actors of their research. The arts and sciences were still closely linked. A bourgeois elite in Europe studied everywhere in Heidelberg, in Bern, or even in Freiburg or in, in other countries. And it was the period when philosophy was the leading discipline and people in Germany spoke of the Geisteswissenschaften, the humanities. Remember, for example, Wilhelm Dilthey's introduction to the Geisteswissenschaften written in the late 19th century. Scientific knowledge was here strongly conceived as historical hermeneutics. There may have been certain delays in institution building in Europe, for example, in the Russian Empire of the late Tsarist period. But I don't think that one has to speak generally of drastic asynchronicity in the East-West comparison in general. Rather, one could, should speak of temporal parallelism, extensive synchronization dynamics, or a general belief in a pan-European and all-European modernization project of the elites. It was not a heyday of uh, synchronicities, in my view. I cannot speak of literary study in the proper sense here either, but of philology. And the foundation for the future were laid by many individual actors, um, not only in literary studies, but in, in general at the universities. I would have to mention Weber and Husserl here, but also people who are important for our West-East view. For example, Lukács' theory of the novel from 1916, which, was, uh, which started as a book on Dostoevsky. And um, it was um, afterwards in, uh, intensively read by Bakhtin or Jan Ignazi Nietzschewaf Baudouin de Courtenay, of course, also Saussure and Alexander Veselovsky, who was important for the formalists. So I, I, I can only name them. But let me conclude this period with Jakobson's example, which already extends into the avant-garde. For we should remember that Shklovsky wrote his important articles already in this phase. Iskustva Kakpriom was written in, uh, no, was published in 1916. Um, in Jacobson's work, one can see the process of differentiation of the discipline of literary studies very well, and it is still regarded as an all European project in this time. In an autobiographical retrospect from 1966, Roman Jacobson looks back on his time as a student of Slavic philology at the Moscow University in the summers of 1915 and 16. The war is already there. A time spent as a field researcher, Jakobsen, remember, he was really an ethnographer in, as a student. A field researcher near Moscow with fellow students, Bakateryov and Yakovlev. It, it, it reflects on the similarity at the time of literature and ethnography, or I call it for, to be more simple folklore, which had been advantageous for his academic training but brought him methodolog methodological disadvantages. By means of retrospection, he calls for two disciplines and methods in the future. Jakobson regards the beginning of his article, it's a famous article, maybe not everybody knows about um, it from you, Die Folklore als eine besondere Form des Schaffens. So folklore is an important way of, of um, yeah, um, um, 
doing, of um, practicing. And the co-author was uh, Piotr Bakateriov. It was published in German in 1929, and uh, it reflects his university experience as a folklorist or ethnographer of literature. Here he praises what he sees in retrospect as interdisciplinary teaching, which introduced students to both literate poets and folk narrators, but emphasized similarities rather than differences and divergencies. And I give you a quote to make it a little bit more um, easier for you. Uh, that's, an, um, that's from the retrospect, so you have to to have to, to account that he's looking back on his time a uh, little bit with nostalgic on and also in view of his um, um, his interest in in separate disciplines the close associations uh, between letters and folklore in our ac academic tradition was certainly most beneficial the intense interchange between these two areas was attentively studied and the marked interest in the creative individuality of the literate, poet, uh, the literate poet was extended by several generations of researchers to folk narrators as well. The negative side of this exclusive preoccupation with the historical and structural similarities between written and oral production um, was a relative disregard for, the, uh, for their divergencies. According to the, and that's the most important part, maybe in, in this quote, according to the current tenet of our teachers and older colleagues, folklore was but a part of literature. So empirical um, literary studies uh, was part of doing literature, literary studies. And the dissimilarities between oral and written poetry were only quantitative. However, any immediate contact with the popular tradition is close to us, its cardinal qualitative difference from any literate state and develop, uh, development. The existence of transitional borderline phenomena is unable to in invalidate the fact of two essential heterogeneous uh, provinces. That's important. So he is he's regarding it as two, two different provinces, the oral and the written. After years of deliberations, Bokatiryov and I decided to bring up this complex. If we recognize folklore and letters as two autonomous varieties of one genus, we can hardly encompass this whole by the label literatures. Because the letters suggest primarily the idea of writings, the phrase oral literature carries the tinge of an axiomoron. So what happens here? In 1966, despite his praise of field research, um, you can see the praise still, Jakobsson thus critically evaluates the broad 19th century concept of literature used by his university teachers in Moscow and contrasts it with the now accepted view that there are two autonomous ge genera, namely oral and written literature, and that neither can be analyzed or taught on a single concept of literature. Thus, according to Jakobson, only a rhetorical figure such as the exumeron or contradictio in adjecto still binds oral and written literature together. Jakobson reproduces the view of his teachers like a fairy tale story from ancient times. He himself, the modernizer, on the other hand, appears with Bakateryov as a disciplinary innovator as the founder of a truly methodologically sound literary science and a literary concept of literature. His autobiographical retrospect that testifies to the gradual, the gradual separation of folklore and literature, of ethnology, you could say, or empirical literary studies and literature in university philology in the two disciplines. So that in 1966, after you could say 50 years, Jakobson was able to recount the broad concept of literature of his 19th century trained teachers as a pre-modern scientific episode. Modernized and differentiated literary studies will leave the oral, popular and folk parts of literature to ethnology, to ethnolinguistics, to medial, medieval studies or folklore. So let's finish here and 
we go to the most maybe important period, the interwar period for literary studies. Um, I'm hopeful you're still with me and it was not too, too much information. Uh, please, uh, please ask if you have questions or something um, that's not, um, is not self, self um, that's it, um, it's not clear after hearing it. The interwar period is certainly, especially in the decade in and after the war and, and in the 1920s, a time of, uh, you could say with uh, Lottmann, uh, of cultural explosion. And I'm certainly not the first or not the last to tell you this. Um, new cultural ideas and concepts, Lottmann says, emerge from rupture, accident, or as he says, semiotic explosions. I'm not sure if this can claim general validity, but perhaps Lottmann, who was born in 1922, is indeed right with regard to his, this period, even if, if it comes to an abrupt end in the 1930s, not only in the East, but also in the West. Temporarily, the artistic avant-garde throughout Europe dominate this period, interacting with the scientific avant-garde. And I will always speak a little, bit, a little bit about the artistic and the scientific avant-garde. I think they are closely linked um, and they both emerge in this period. Phenomenology also plays an important role in this process, which also has an early Polish and Russian, Russian support, as you know them, like Roman Ingarden or Gustav Speed. In terms of time, a kind of futurology reigns, a passionate forward-looking attitude, you could say. Everything is future oriented. It is a phase of experimentation into the future. This includes not only early Soviet artists, and we focused a lot in the last decades on, on them, not only early Soviet artists and scientists, but also, for example, the German cultural studies with Kassira and Weber, which experiment and also become established um, um, as academics in the academia. Not only in the early Soviet Union, but also in German speaking countries or in interwar Poland, literary or artistic questions are now being linked with social, democratic and political concerns, although in varying degrees. Looking at East and West roughly, I would like to say that the motor of these developments of many arts and also of literary studies in Europe is to be found in Central and Eastern Europe. And that's not a new thesis. That's the, the, you could say the nucleus of this development is not in Paris anymore. It's not in, 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 in Berlin. It's mostly comes from, uh, from the periphery, from uh, if you want to call it periphery, um, when in, 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 in geographically it's Central and Eastern Europe. Parallel to this development, however, these innovations also initiate a process of stronger disciplinary boundaries and autonomous aesthetics. Um, autonomous aesthetics is ultimately strongly revalued, re 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 you could say. It's, it's much more important. Since the avant-garde precisely advance their political and social concerns with, with an idea of dehistoricized and I would say even purified arts. I try to show this again with the example of Jakobson. As shown above, Jakobson propagates a new literary science purged, you could say, of folklore, empirism, and orality. The ideas of autonomy and maybe abstraction even that have existed in literary studies and philosophy since the Weimar classicism, Moritz, for example, and Schiller, or romanticism, the Schlegels, uh, we could easily say, um, are at uh, work here. The concrete ideas were produced in the literature of Russian speaking French or Polish symbolists or symbolism and then reinforced at the be beginning of the uh, 20th century. The avant-garde took up this idea of autonomous um, art, even if they had di uh, different political goals than the symbolists, for example. So give, I will give you the example of Jakob Zorn, who is not an avant-gardist in the, in, the in, the, in the strict sense, but um, he brought, you could say, 
ideas from the artistic avant-garde into the scientific avant-garde. Jakob Son exchanged ideas with Hletnikov and Mayakovsky. We know about it. He wrote about it. He gave papers on Stefan Malamé's Lazure as a precocious student and was inspired by Albert Thibault's Malamé book from 1912. Interesting reading for everybody who's interested in, um, in Jakobson. It was a close and self-evident interweaving um, of artistic and scientific activity at the time, especially in, in Eastern Europe. If one looks at the avant-garde, the artistic and the scientific uh, avant-garde of the 1910s and the interwar period from today's perspective, one could name three central events as important milestones in the scientification of literary research and its demarcation from folklore, literary pragmatics, literary history. And these milestones can be found in Paris, Moscow, and Switzerland, you could say. I could enlarge it, but I focus on three uh, events. Marinetti's Manifesto Futurisme, the Futurist Manifesto of 1999 in the French daily Le Figaro, Viktor Shklovsky's first formalist publication with the pamphlet Vaskesiene Slova, Revival of the Word of 1914, as well as Iskustva Kakbriom, Art as Device, published in Moscow in 1916, in the midst of the, world, uh, the, the First World War. And uh, of course, Saussure's Cours de Linguistique Générale, also published in Lausanne and Paris in 1916. The, despite starting with Marinetti in Paris, as the old cultural center of the 19th century, the artistic avant-garde developed very quickly and strongly in Central and Eastern Europe and generally in the European periphery because in countries with, um, you could say, weak democracies or authoritarian governments, as in Poland at this time, um, the avant-garde seemed to represent forms of alternative critique and protest whereby they no longer want to reform the weak and corrupt institutions via their radical practices, but to abolish them straight away. The avant-garde as an explicit movement of rupture, of rupture and creation through destruction. That's an um, expression who developed, um, as you know, Bakunin in Dresden on the barricades, uh, creation through destruction who was very, uh, uh, interesting for the avant-garde who have a linkage to the anarchism, show here their revolutionary potential in the country with, with weak democratic institutions. And I have to add in, in a positive and uh, also in a negative way. So it's not um, neutral here, but is, uh, this is not the issue here. Maybe only one example. So also Lev Trotsky, famously explains the phenomenon of artistic avant-garde in the periphery, as he calls it, Italy and Russia, with the enthusiasm of the industrial area guard for avant-garde progress in art. At the same time, he describes futurism as a European phenomenon, that's a quote, and emphasizes that, that as an artistic movement, um, um, which was linked to the political and social order from the very beginning. So that was the interest of Trotsky in the avant-garde. The avant-garde of literary theory emerged to a large extent in the central and eastern part of Europe, where the artistic avant-gardes were also strong. Galin Tichanov has explained this in his famous article already, The Birth of Modern Literary Theory in East Central Europe. Locating the beginnings of literary theory with the formalist, the Prague structuralist, with Lukács, Lucien Goldman, and others. I quote Tikhanov, the Russian formalists were the first to see literature as an autonomous domain for theoretical investigation. And in their work, they steered away from aesthetics, sociolo sociology, psychology, and history while seeking support in linguistics. End of quote. The literary models of the Russian formalists are therefore more radical and only take full effect um, during the Cold War, uh, I think, and not before uh, the war. One can easily parallel Shklovsky's research for the prion, for the device and alienation, the, the, the astranienie techniques in literature 
and the formalist and then structuralist search for literaturness or literariness with the avant-garde dreams for poor essence and poor form through the autonomization of the elements. After word, line, tone, form, color, movement, and I have some <laughs> random pictures for you here. You have the color on Kandinsky, and you have the form here, moving the black in the Tretiakovsky problem, probably um, uh, Malevich. Um, 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 famous quick, uh, black square from 1916. You have here Hima um, Klimt, but she's not usually in this line, but I brought her in for have a woman um, um, avant-garde um, painter also. That's another one from her. And uh, you could also end with the device um, um, like Astranieni or device the priom uh, of um, Viktor Shklovsky in this line. So you have um, word line, tone, form, color, movement. The priom was used as the basal, pro uh, basal procedure, you could say, and artistic means of aesthetic art analysis. Even before formalism, Malamé's Livre Absolu and his idea of pur, pur son poor sound, Arnold Schoenberg's obsession with the quality of each sound, Kandinsky's reflection on the effect and spirit of color and line, Malievich's rigor and absolutization of um, form in the black square, or Meyerhold, even you could also name Meyerhold's idea of the mechanics of movement in the theater are among the well-known example of this reduction and autonomization of the elements of arts. The emptying of form of its content formed the prerequisite for its use as a basic artistic means for political, religious, and social purposes. And the idea of the art of living, the Schizenet Borchestra, you could say, propagated by the avant garde um, um, is only possible by this kind of reduction, purification. Oliver Machert, uh, um, a professor for uh, philosophy in Vienna, has therefore described the avant-garde as an autonomous form of heteronomy. So you have the autonomous form, and that's why you can have always this kind of um, political or religious um, um, aim. Because only the achievement of autonomy allows it use for political or social purposes. Only the exposure of the autonomy of the device of art and elements of art allowed their fut uh, future use and reception. This made it easy for avant-garde to become design, for poetry to become propaganda, and for images to become political posters. Art and community life can be organized, reflected upon, or carried out according to the same aesthetic principles. With Jacques Rancière, it could be argued that only this primary aesthetics reduced to the primordial sensual enabled politicians afterwards, also from fascism and also um, um, from, from other fields of the um, politics and artists to work in the same field and to use common means of expression. And therefore, we have questionable alliances of writers with powerful party leaders, like in the case of Mayakovsky, famously, or um, D'Annunzio and Mussolini, to bring not only um, a case from the East. In retrospect, the condensation of avant-garde and avant-garde science seems particularly high in formalism and also in structuralism. And that is also the reason why the politicians and functionaries in the 30s everywhere ult ultimately fought these dangerous Ukrainian, Russian, and Yiddish avant-gardes. But let us look for closing once again to Jakob Son. In his obituary for Bakatirov in 1975, Jakob Son even reaffirmed his intention to separate folkloristics and literary studies, to purify, to autonomize both fields. And I have a, a small quote. The necessity for clear-cut delimitation, delimitation between literary history and folkloristics and the need to rehabil rehabilitate the autonomy of the latter were for both of us from the days of the Moscow linguistic circle on a burning topic of discussion. 
which in 1929 found its final expression in our joint essay that was in this German essay in the Festschrift I quoted before. Jakob Son and Bakatyuryov made this practice of separating to rehabilitate the autonomy of a, the autonomy, a program with regard to folkloristics and literary studies. In doing so, they used the parole long difference by associating folklore with long and literature with parole. In the above mentioned essay, the folklore as a special form of creation published in German, Bakatyuryov and Jakobson engage in enlightenment work against the previous fusion of oral and written literature. With parole, um, sorry, and against the idea that folklore is an achievement of the individual. Um, maybe I, I'm shorten now a little bit um, because I think um, there won't be enough time to discuss. And maybe I come to a last um, um, example. Um, in, in this period, as a final example of the furor for aesthetic and functional autonomy in this period, I would like to cite the thesis of the Prague Linguistic Circle, also the Prager Linguistenkreis, um, on the first International Slavonic Congress, also from 1929, which, as it is well known among linguists already, um, at least, were written by Willem Mathesius, Roman Jakobson, and sorry, Alexander, if I don't uh, have the right um, Czech pronunciation, Bohuslav Hafranek and Jan Bukarszowski. And it was published in Czech and French. You see always this kind of, it was still uh, a Slavic language and a French, um, uh, um, a Western language, as we would say maybe, um, and they didn't say at the time together and in which folklore already plays no role. Here you can see the impulses still come from Central and Eastern Europe, but already partly come from exiled persons, Jakobson, for example. This will, of course, increase after 1945. And in these theses, the poetic language is again referred to as parole, like before. There are various remarks on poetic language that postulate classical autonomy aesthetic thesis. I quote, the, organize, the organizing character, characteristics of art is that it does not aim at the signified, but the sign itself. For this reason, the poetic language as such, and that's, we heard something similar already, the poetic language as such must be examined and not explanations of the social, uh, sociological and psychological history of ideas. The word as such, Slovakak Takovoye, is familiar to us from the most famous manifesto of the Russian Futurists from 1912, and thus appears 17 years later as poetic language as such in the likewise manifesto thesis of the Prague structuralists. That's maybe one example for the, the linkage between um, artistic and scientific avant-garde. In the interwar period, the principle of autonomy, I could um, end, is pursued in the avant-garde and in the academia even though there are great debates about it. Remember the formalism debate in the Soviet Union or the expressionism debate by German and Austrian Marxists. East Central European formalism and structuralism drive the scientification and academization of literary studies through essays, theses and congresses, even though the syncretism of subjects and the plurality of disciplines are still present. The hermeneutic and philosophical tradition in Central and Eastern Europe was less strongly positioned compared maybe to Austria or France or even Germany, which allowed to for more radical cuts and more daring steps and immediately made the new discipline of linguistics the leading discipline of several fields in Central and Eastern Europe. Let us go to the... Um, Next topic, the period after 
uh, the Cold War and um, I have two shorter periods now and I will um, close the lecture shortly. It is easy to accuse literary studies in the East over politicization and ideology. But it is also relatively easy to accuse Western literary studies of the post-war period in the 1950s and 60s of being close to the apolitical. Once in an avant-garde variant, the example of Welig and Warren, and once in a hermeneutic variant, the example of Emil Steiger, for example. The theory of literature, and I brought you the book here in the first edition by the and I, I speak slowly, the Vienna-born Czech-American literary scholar René Velik, which he wrote together with Austin Warren, appeared in 1948. Velik took up the theories of Russian formalism, the ideas of uh, the pole Roman Ingarden, and the Prague structuralism, the thesis I showed you a moment ago, and transferred them to the USA when he emigrated in 1939. To show the impact of this widely published and translated book on the US literary studies would require a monograph in its own right, I think. The effect was huge and thus shows the transfer of theory from East to a transatlantic West and can hint at the fact that formalism and structuralism could only return to the post-socialist countries in great scope after 1991 via postmodernism and post-structuralism. In this period, divergencies in time regimes begin and produce asynchronicities that we still feel, uh, still feel today, so in, my, in, in my opinion. Asynchronicities in the Cold War period no longer have a productive effect and become effective through transfer and reception. Instead, developments here in the Cold War period, or better, I, I could say non-developments, sit quasi in a closed time court or a time cage, uh, you could say, a, a kind of um, Zeitkäfig, I always say um, in German. After Velik's book, Wolfgang Kaiser's Das Sprachliche Kunstwerk also appeared in 1948 and was regularly reprinted until 1992, 20 editions, for example. Steiger's Grundbegriffe der Poetik had already appeared in Switzerland in 1946. The connections between new criticism, the immanent method, the Werkimmanente Methode, the practice of close reading so prevalent in the US and formalism and structuralism are well known, though not well studied in their historical significance, I think. Autonomy aesthetics and Schiller's aesthetic man who is families only fully human where he, he plays, as er spielt, um, are omnipresent in these propedeutic textbooks. Despite the 1968 movement, with its claim to new forms of life, rupture, and the engaged and activist scholarship, one can speak of the primacy of autonomy aesthetics in Western Europe. This is why Michael Müller and Horst Bredekamp in a volume of, on the autonomy of art edited in 1972, only five years after 68, soberly state, I, I quote, the idea of the autonomy of art has not been outlived. So for Italy and France, one should have to take in account the reception of Heidegger, but it's, it's, I cannot do it here. However, this partly a political orientation of literary studies after 1945 in the West and the autonomy of literature, which dominates above all in German studies, do not necessarily mean that there is a connection here to the ideologies of the Cold War. Entanglement with Nazism and fascism was maybe a stronger motive, at least in Germany and Austria, to fear a politics of literature. Um, nevertheless, uh, you could say reflections on the consequences of the political ideologization of the blocks for the humanities have only been made recently in mainly with reference to art and art criticism. Many works on the institutional and disciplinary consequences of the so-called 
called War Modernism, there are a lot of publications now on it, deal with the connection of the American Expressionist avant-garde and the financial support by American services. Um, one does not have to look. Um, one does not have to look at the Soviet Union with Kreuz as an implementation of the avant-garde project in terms of content and concept to understand that there were different interpretations of the avant-garde in East and West in this time. And yet, surprisingly, um, similarities emerged. The most um, surprising similarity for me was the death of the author. We know all the text from Barthes uh, and Foucault, but there's also um, a book already, I think, six years old from Petri Petrov on the death of the author um, in socialist realism. And so you see, we have the death of the author in, in, in both spheres, you could say. That's, for example, an uh, um, uh, interesting similarity. Somewhat overstating the case, one could say um, that the West makes autonomy absolute and the second world sticks primarily to the principle of heteronomy in order to build socialist society. Literature is supposed to represent socialist actors, actions and socialist society as it should be. Which, which means that literature in the socialist realm does not even relinquish its imaginary and fictional potential to begin with, but only subordinates these potentials to one single goal. The natural ability of poets and their literature to lie, one could ironically conclude with Plato, is brought under state control and used pragmatically in the sense of an overall socialist goal. Although socialist realism refers to all the arts, it has a grammatocentric focus, which Boris Kreuz has even declared to be a characteristic feature of communism as a whole. He says it in, in this new, this not so recent book on the communist postscript. Um, uh, in communism, he says, one builds a literary, not an aesthetic state like, like Schiller. Um, he speaks even from a linguistic turn on the level of social practice. You see, Kreuz is the one who only, um, always want to compare the avant-garde, both, uh, both avant-garde in East and West. Um, in the understanding of socialist realism, autonomy is defamed as formalism and expressionism and, and is trimmed back to a humanistic traditional understanding of literature and art tied to the classical per period. Because the proletariat, sorry, I have to speak slow, more slowly, can only write classless literature through bourgeois literature. In its self understanding, socialist realism thus rescues the avant garde form, its own iconoclasm. Because, as you remember, avant garde throws Pushkin of the steam of history in the Futurist Manifesto or regards museums as graveyards, Malevich, for example, or famously wants to replace the Nico of Samotrak with a car, as Marinette says. And you could say the social realism uh, um, uh, rescues um, the avant garde from this iconoclasm. One could um, almost polemically say that the art of living, the, the, the Schizen at Worcester project of the avant-garde from the interwar, interwar period was tested in two laboratory, um, lab, laboratory experiments. The West reduced the avant-garde to artistic expression. The East reduced them to life and practice. Aesthetic modernity versus social modernity, we could conclude. It is a divided avant-garde in cold times, where once heteronomy and once autonomy is politically pragmatized. Autonomy aesthetics in the West was proof of progressiveness of the political system on the basis of individual artistic products. Heteronomy aesthetics in the East was proof of the transfer of collective literary ideas into the living, into the life of the people. The heteronomous uh, autonomy Oliver Machat stated for the avant-garde was kept, you could say, from two sides, even if it never existed in poor form here or there. This had an impact on disciplines, institutions, and ideas, 
And this point, I would like to bring folklore, ethnology, cultural studies into the field again. The depoliticization of literary studies in the West took place unnoticed in the universalization of avant-garde metaphors of progressiveness, literariness, um, autonomy aesthetics, premises, poetic function, and deep pragmatization of the concept of literature. Through the academization of literary studies, literature is simultaneously transferred into the field of nature universalized and set apart from the colorful many cultures. Um, yeah, I will finish here and I, I give you maybe the end um, of um, a kind of uh, a look out on the 90 and the period after 1989 and, and 91. Um, and this is the smallest, the smallest chapter, maybe because I lived it also. After the end of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the independence of many states like Ukraine, um, there are opposing catching up movements in literary studies in East and West that carry their own asynchronicity phenomena. These processes were faster and more intense in the East, but they are, were also felt in the West. The reappropriation of formalism and structuralism in Eastern institutions is happening in the 1990s. We are an almost, I would call it, even frenetic reception of post-structuralism and post-modernism. Don't get me wrong, structuralism had not completely disappeared or vanished in the East. The Tartu Moscow School of Lotman and Uspensky is perhaps the, the most famous example. But the school was still marginalized. After 1991, Bakhtin and Lotman were enthusiastically received, but also Derrida, Foucault, Baudrillard, you know the names, Deleuze Guattari, and authors like Benjamin. The Moscow publishing house Ad Margin and Press, which was founded in Moscow in 1993, it refers to a, a, a picture of Paul Klee, can perhaps be mentioned here as a, a representative of this development. However, it seems to me that it was precisely the very radical approaches of the post-structuralists that offered many chairs, cathedras, and institutions in the post-socialist countries only few points of contact, or you could say useful interfaces. We have also to remember that in the West, these currents were still fought um, until the noughties. So that many places, tended to stick to old methods and theories because no connections or interfaces between formal methods and new methods emerged. Uh, it may have worked for Moscow or for emigrated professors in the US, but not for everyone, I would say, in literary studies in the, in the post-socialist uh, states in the 90s, maybe even in the, in the beginning of the millennium. They did stick to their historical approach to literature without normative interpretations. On the other side, many Western researchers and institutions said goodbye to the separation of disciplines and supposedly autonomy and avant-garde aesthetics. But the West, that is my impression, thought arrogantly that there was little to learn from literary institutions in the East because they were only beginning to, to, to play catch up in cultural studies, sociology, world literature, or anthropology. The clear sign for slow change were the new faculties of cultural studies that emerged in the 1990s, our Viadrina, I could say, and the increasing and ongoing talk of interdisciplinarity. The emergence of cultural studies was meant to fill the gap created by the purification of literary studies from pragmatics, from empiricism, from sociology, from ethnology, from histor history. This embrace also meant an end to the theory of literature, because now one had to take care of the theories of the other disciplines as well. The Franken concept of literature underwent a stress test, you could say. Um, the end of literary theory has often been marked. Galin Tichanov places it at the end of the 90s. In Germany, one can also mention Yao's establishment of literary anthropology at the University of Constance, or the founding of the cultural studies faculties in, in, at the Viatrina, or Lottmann's death in 1993. 
uh, which, uh, who has incidentally have been in constant shortly before. Maybe one can also critically remark on the closure, the dissolving of the Academy of Sciences, the Akademie der Wissenschaften of the GDR in 1992. But the Denkschrift Geisteswissenschaften is perhaps the best example today, since this paper itself cites the end of the autonomous individual sciences, which had lost the common spirit of the humanities and has now to reach out to the concept of culture to, yeah, to, um, to, um, to develop once more. Let me end, and this is really the last two sentences. Let me end with Jakobson against the crane of the beginning, uh, beginning of the folklore as a special form on creation in 1929. The philosophical, the philosophical world of naive realism may be completely alien. So the, the, the text is the German uh, version is the original. Um, may be completely alien to the modern researchers, but nevertheless, a whole series of formulations that are direct consequences of the philosophical presuppositions of science in the second half of the 19th century live on in various fields of cultural studies, a smuggled ballast as a survival that constrains the development of science. Durchgeschmuggelter Ballast als eine in die Entwicklung der Wissenschaft hemmendes Überbleibsel. The survival, of course, comes as a term from Edward Burnett Tyler's Primitive Cultures of 1871. Perhaps today, almost 90 years later, it is worth looking for the disruptive survival in literary studies in both East and West, and not just as a hindrance or a ballast. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Annette. I, I will do the applause uh, for all the others who are muted. <laughs> thank you. So. We are on the screen here. You are. Yes, that was a big overview over, let's just say, the history of humanities from a perspective of literary and cultural studies from before First World War over interwar period to second after Second World War over Cold War till today, with a focus on uh, this division between uh, folklorism and literary studies, and uh, with a the thesis in the end that there is a big division uh, between East and West, considering uh, avant-garde and considering uh, somehow autonomy of literature and uh, mimesis, problematic reality and literature. And I, I see already, I've seen already the first question here uh, from, uh, one second, um, I will start with Alexander Avramchuk. I just will yes. read out it here. It's uh, thank you for such a wonderful paper. Could you please elaborate more on the cooperation between the Prague linguistic circle and the Polish linguists? Jakob, Jakobson mentioned Franciszek Szydlewski, with whom he was in touch before 1939 during the war already in the United States. Jakobson have cooperated with Manfred Kridl, a left-wing literary scholar from Vilno in the 19th mm. This Jakobson has revived his Polish connections, especially as he met Krystyna Pomorska in 1958. Uh, the, the same uh, war, uh, year Foucault came to Warsaw to head the French Institute, and subsequently in the 1960s, Poland became a major meeting point of linguists from West and East, the Iron Curtain notwithstanding. What is the Polish contribution to the formalism and the new? literary theories uh, question from uh, Alexander. Yeah, that's a, um, a good question. Um, I'm not so knowledgeable about, I'm only um, reading it. Um, I'm only, you probably, um, Alexander, know much more about uh, this. I. Um, had uh, uh, some um, connection to the Polish formalists in my um, time in Tübingen because um, uh, Michał Rugalski wrote about it and made um, um, uh, a book on Polish formalism. So I know only the roughly the things 
which are published. I, I myself didn't uh, research it, so I didn't look up um, primary sources or um, look up more than there is. But I, I would say like you, there is a lot to do and you could, especially as you say, in the, in the Cold War period, um, the connections between um, uh, French and uh, Polish institutions. So I'm, I can only add things you already know, but I, I would say that it would be interesting to bring all the things together and to have a more um, in-depth um, knowledge about um, Polish formalism, Polish linguistics, Czech linguistics. The, it's, I took it easier because the, the, the French structuralists are much more popular, you could say, um, or much more um, research. So I took, took the easy way. But I thank you for the suggestion to work also much more in, in this direction, especially at the Viadrina. Yeah, the next question would be from Galina Babak. Yeah, I... that's the book Claudia uh, told about it. It's it's upcoming. Yeah, that's why I, <laughs> I can't say so much. It's still upcoming. Uh, but when Shama Shahad at Irina um, uh, Woodstorf and Michal Murugalski will publish it, I think, um, um, Alexander, you, you will have answered your uh, questions a little bit more. Uh, yes. uh, nice. Yeah, hello to everybody once, once, uh, once more. Dear Netas, thank you uh, very much for your wonderful and rich presentation. Uh, I discovered a lot of um, uh, details <coughs> in it, uh, <coughs> but still uh, I have like more like a, a, a wide comment on your presentation in general and probably uh, several more questions. Um, yeah, um, thanks once more for uh, the example of the formal theory. I think it's like the best theory of uh, the best example of the um, circulating of uh, scientific knowledge between uh, East and West and the West and East, <laughs> there and back. And uh, my first comment uh, will concern uh, the original uh, origins of uh, the Russian formalism. Um, and I would like you to comment a little bit uh, more. I mean, the uh, so-called psychologization of the humanities of the second half of the 19th century. And uh, like uh, I think the all, all we know uh, about the influence of psychology and uh, on the in the humanities and precise on the literary studies. And uh, of course, Russian formalism um, didn't emerge like in the uh, empty field of knowledge, and it was much influenced by uh, German uh, literary and uh, uh, literary historians and uh, uh, philosophers like uh, uh, Steintal, uh, Christiansen, or uh, Wilhelm Wundt, for example. He had a huge influence on the. Develop for the development of uh, like uh, literary uh, history and linguistics and so on. Uh, so that would be probably my, my first question, because I think it's a very good example of uh, the influence of the Western academia, uh, a so-called cultural transfer, uh, according to Michel Espagne, and uh, the emergence of the uh, literary theory, according to Galen Tikhanov, in the pre-revolutionary uh, uh, Russian empire. Uh, and uh, like tracing its development back uh, to the West, yeah. And uh, um, uh, also I would like to uh, address uh, another one uh, question is, uh, um, uh, you were uh, mentioning for several times uh, Galen Tikhanov's work and probably his last book, The Birth and the Death of Literary Theory from 19, uh, 2019. And uh, he actually uh, talks about a very, uh, in my uh, opinion, fruitful and interesting idea of the, um, of the uh, he tries to answer the question, why uh, formalism and literary theory and the uh, um, accent of on, uh, on autonomy of literature emerged precise in the pre-revolutionary Russia. And his idea is that uh, uh, that is why in uh, uh, Russian, uh, I mean, not only Russian, but Russian imperial culture, there were not so strong uh, philosophical tradition, for example, as it was in Germany. Uh, he, uh, I mean, Galen Tikhanov, he didn't like go further, 
um, um, in commenting uh, this idea, and uh, probably you could a uh, little bit extend or comment on this uh, on this precise uh, aspect. And uh, uh, the last, uh, uh, but not the least, uh, the last comment on the question is uh, uh, concerning the the political aspect of uh, the exchange exchanging of uh, knowledge. Uh, the question is um, um, taking into account a uh, political and ideological situation of each receiving culture. Uh, could we, in general, talk about the simultaneous uh, simulta simultaneity in the development of scientific knowledge? Uh, so it seems that your talk uh, demonstrates us. Um, uh, in uh, various aspects that it's really hard to talk about, even uh, about the process that uh, historically were happening at the same time, but they had different uh, content, aims, tools, and were uh, transformed in the uh, receiving culture. And here, I would like you to comment a little bit more on the article of Roman Jakobson uh, published in 1929 in uh, in Prague in German uh, German journal über die heutigen Vorsausetzen der Russischen Slavistik, uh, where he uh, where he talks about the uh, the need of implementation of uh, uh, Russian uh, formalist theory to the uh, Western Slavistic and in general Western knowledge, but at the same time he talks about the expansion of the uh, Russian culture to the West. Uh, yeah, probably, the, I'm very sorry for <laughs> such a wide comment, but. Thank you, Galina, and thank you for this um, um, important questions. I'm not sure if I, I can answer everything, but maybe let me start with the question um, on influences or receiving cultures. You're right. I, I made a, a kind of rough uh, going through uh, certain aspects because I wasn't so much interested in bringing it right with which influence came first and which was important. You're right. We have the, uh, the neo-Kantianism, uh, for example, very important for the formalists. We have also the Völkerkunde, with, um, who was very important in this time. But I think in Russian formalism, they, they, the new thing uh, there is, is that um, it combines um, literary studies not anymore to philosophy. Also, if they took up um, philosophical ideas or concepts, they are combining it to theory. And what is theory? It's an expression from natural sciences. It's this idea that you have... Um, 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 a scientific approach and, and not a philosophical approach to um, theory. And that's why a theory was so much loved, the formalist theory in the 60s, you could say. And we, everybody spoke about theory, not about philosophy, uh, because it, um, linguistics brought this kind of scientific thinking into structuralism and, um, and, um, and, and formalism. And so there is still the influence, but I think it's a kind of break uh, all the same in Russian formalism, who le uh, leaves behind, um, in a certain sense, uh, the philosophy, the hermeneutics, uh, which was very, you're right, very, very important um, in this time. Um, Eric, you, you made a, a convention on new Kantianism, maybe a neu Kantianismus, you know much more about it. Um, then, um, I think if we are looking out for asynchronicity, it's not so much about um, getting better influences and transfers. It's like looking up for um, uh, convergencies and divergencies um, in, in a certain time period. Who explains maybe because um, one concept is left out and another one is um, um, taken in consideration. So I try to, to not to mark the influences, but to, um, to compare maybe influences in this time, not to make a genealogical 
um, history of Russian formalism, which somebody made already probably, um, but to, to compare, you could say, um, different um, um, timings in reception in the East and the West. So that, that's maybe the, the small shift I tried to do um, um, in this conference. Um, the another questions um, you said is um, um, yeah the the article I'm I brought the article from 1929 because it for me it was an example and the folklorism I know you're not interested in in the topic folklorism I took it up because I think it could uh, be an example where you see already still this kind of um, intertwined action you have an two Russian scholars who publish in a German festschrift for Danish scholar and other examples you brought um, up and, and they have this common project to, um, to make new disciplines, to make uh, more scientific disciplines also, to make um, more disciplines in the whole of Europe um, and uh, to struggle with the old visions um, of, of the disciplines. Um, and um, that's maybe was the example. And you, I, I'm, I agree with you. And this time in the interwar period, you have still simultaneity, if you wanted to say this, uh, Galina. There is still a kind of um, togetherness of the scientific community in East and West in literary studies to, to ha they have the same aims. They want to, um, uh, to scientificize, to academize, uh, academize um, literary studies or linguistics or even sociology. So um, that was the, um, um, that was why I tried to um, um, give an example uh, with Jakobson as a scholar who moves between scientific communities and everywhere tries the same, you could say. And then there is this kind of rupture in the, in the Cold War period where the developments uh, don't interconnect so much. Maybe you're right, um, Alexander, there are still more uh, movements than I, I gave here, because maybe it was very important that the French went um, to Warsaw to, to do together linguistics. And you have also examples, um, Galin brought them from, um, um, she gives, uh, he gives the example of Julia Kristeva, of Wodicka, he gives example of figures from the so-called East from Bulgaria, uh, who uh, transfer in narratology certain concepts into um, the Western um, academia. And maybe that, that is another um, example. And why do you had uh, still uh, the question why it didn't work? I think um, in the new book, Galin, it's the thing that they wanted to leave behind the philosophical thinking. I know Galin is always very interested in it, but I think that's that's the reason uh, why there is a kind of, um, of of break. Yeah, so in, in principle, we are at the end of time, but Gautam would like to uh, add uh, one more question. If it's fast, uh, then uh, we for sure can uh, add a question, Gautam. You have to unmute you. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the paper, dear Nette, and thanks, uh, dear Alexander. I was just quickly wondering if uh, you talked of temporal parallelism during your talk, and you also talked of which I would sort of then think is uh, comparable to the concept of multiple temporalities. Now, I'm reminded of this uh, book called Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe from, of course, Reinhard Kosalek. And in the introduction, Koselek famously claims that concepts of time, like the two concepts of temporal experiences and horizons, synchronicities and asynchronicities, and I'm quoting here, are both quote unquote indicators and quote unquote factors of historical change. That is to say, 
that different directions in which temporal processes and movements move are necessarily parallel or can be seen as necessarily parallel. Do you think this uh, Koselec's ideas of uh, are also used are also akin to what you're discussing in your paper and in the project in general? Thank you. Uh, we have even bought a, a picture of Koselec um, to as a kind of a picture for our U time project. So Koselec is very important. I didn't want to to bore you with too much theory on um, non simultaneity and asynchronicities. Uh, we we have discussed it. We read already two. I think two articles from him, and he's very important as a scholar. There are other scholars like Achim Landwehr, for example. We read it to him also, or Jörg, um, Jörg Leonhardt, um, and um, also a scholar from um, the Leibniz Institute for Literary Studies in Berlin. Um, I think I, I didn't want to show that um, for the whole four periods, there's a parallelism. I wanted to show much more that in the first period, we have a kind of, you could say, parallel developments. One, the one is maybe slower, the one is faster, um, but not so many asynchronicities. Then in the second period, it's, it get, it's getting faster developments in, in the literary communities, but still there is inter, um, they are connected. They are going to, you could say, in together, maybe sometimes in different directions, but there are, are um, similar time regimes. But the great break comes after the Second World War, and we are still into it, I would say. And hopefully we can um, discuss it further in, in our project, that in the time of the Cold War, there is no parallel development. Yes, you can say it. You have also the you have the avant-garde project still in the core of the Cold War modernism in the in the in the West, and um, in the socialist realism project in the East. And you know, it's very generalization. I know about the differences, the Bitterfelder Weg in the GDR and everything. Um, and then you have a, a lot of differences um, and a lot of asynchronicities in literary studies. And that was very important to understand certain phenomena um, and um, misunderstanding in the 1990s and maybe in the, in the noughties um, in the new millennium. So um, I think you have in different per periods, different kind of asynchronicities. And the most interesting period, if you look for misunderstandings and a lot of asynchronicities is my view, the, the Cold War period. Um, and there's still coming up things and there you have still to um, discuss and to research uh, things as I was shown. Um, I didn't say a lot about the Baltic states. I didn't say a lot about the Polish um, um, uh, linguistics, um, even the Polish formalists, even the phenomenologists. So there are a lot of things to do. I, I tried to do something in one hour and I, it took me more than one hour, and it's um, difficult to do a whole century in one hour in East and West, and that's why I made a, a little bit yeah, rough decisions, I could say. It took the most famous examples. Maybe I could also speak about Yiddish modernism, yeah, but it's also maybe a thing. It would be uh, not so um, interesting here. Yeah, yeah but good. thank you, Gautam, for the question. I'm sorry for being so slow in developing my English in answering it. So thank you very much. I think we are running out of time. I mean, there, I would have so many questions about uh, the, when, when the East came with uh, classified and the West said just Oedipus complex and when the East said capital and the West said phallus, I think that was a total playfulness and of course a lot of irony in this. And my favorite is Dimitro Chizhevsky who wrote this comparative inner Slavonic literature uh, or what if he's not a member of a school and more school and of mostly forgotten of this, well, there would be 5,006 to discuss. I could go on for hours, but uh, we are running out of time. It's um, 
Uh, thank you then everybody for the please. questions and yeah, I take thank with you. me the questions from uh, the chat. And I as a moderator give now the word to Andri for how we will go on Andri. <laughs> thank you to all, thank you to Annette, thank you for all questions and Andri how do we proceed on? Um, okay dear Alexander that, that's a kind of a surprise but yeah so first of all first of all thank you dear Annette once again thank you Alexander I think that's a perfect. For all I will do it. Uh, exactly for all yeah. For all. <laughs> On Zoom, it's, so a, it's a great well. start. Dear <laughs> colleagues, if I may, it's my spontaneous suggestion. So I'm not sure whether it's my right or wrong. But maybe we could just make a break. No, let's say for plus minus half an hour. And then we just meet again at the same Zoom address. So like we'll stop it now and we'll open it again in half an hour. And we'll continue. Actually, I could tell you already now that we'll hear again about Jakobson and Chizhevsky. So like the same heroes <laughs> will reappear um, in our session moderated by Bozena. So thank you so much again.